how about you, everybody? Welcome. Welcome to the dialogue. This Monday night, 8 p.m. Eastern time. That's Dialogue with Dozy, Facebook, YouTube Live. Thank you for hopping on. <sighs> so tonight, no, let me kick it off like this. Oh, after all these years, it's hard to keep it up. It defined the 80s as much as Reagan, Thatcher, and Filofaxes. 300 million people would get in a lather every week over the world's first super soap, Dallas. I'm still a hero down there. They love me. I love them. Okay, that's it. That's one of the most iconic intros to any television series in the history of American TV. That's Dallas. So I'm tipping the cap tonight to uh, Larry Hagman who took the character J.R. Ewan to extraordinary lengths. And uh, I'm wearing the fedora in, uh, in homage to the great late, the late great uh, Larry, Larry Hagman, who left us in 2013, who was the absolute star of Dallas. So tonight the dialogue just takes a look back at the motion, at the, at the TV series, Dallas. Dallas was a first of its kind. It was it kicked off the genre in American TV of late night soaps uh, that led the way for to Dallas and perhaps uh, what thought it would be its its closest uh, rival was, was uh, Dynasty, or as the people used to say in the hood, Dynasty, um, Knott's Landing, Falcon Crest, and uh, and several other. In fact. Uh, Knott's Landing was a, a spinoff of Dallas. Several of other soap operas, uh, midnight, uh, not midnight, late night soap operas that usually aired after 10 o'clock because of their content. By the way, speaking of content, tonight uh, you may hear some words that we normally don't do in the dialogue. It'll be a little big boy TV tonight, some of the clips that we're gonna play. But we just decided that we're gonna be looking back at several TV uh, shows, and we're kicking out with one of my absolute uh, most enjoyables, and that is that's Dallas. Uh, Dallas aired on CBS TV, uh, Lorimar Productions, from uh, 20, uh, I'm sorry, from 1981, and it ended in uh, 90, 93 uh, with a 12 with a year run, and it was resurrected. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little later. But tonight, let's just get right into some of the things that happened on Dallas. We're gonna use tonight. We're gonna look at several clips. Uh, there have been a lot of documentaries, a lot of lookbacks, a lot of inside looks of a lot of reunion of the cast and everything. Dallas had an ensemble cast that was led by what was supposed to be Big Jim Davis and Barbara Bell Geddes, who played the characters of Jock Ewan and um, and and uh, Miss Ellie. Some of y'all remember that, don't you, Jock and Miss Ellie? And uh, actually, let's do this clip, and then let's do this series of clips. We'll do ABC, and then we'll come back, and we'll talk more about, about Dallas. Oh, after all these years, it's hard to keep it up. <laughs> OK, let's, let's go ahead and do B and C. Uh, you're getting, you're getting a, uh, just, a, just a glimpse of what it was like on the set of Dallas. Uh, yeah, let's 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 do uh, clips uh, B and C, and uh, we'll we'll stop there. We'll you'll get a feel for some of the shenanigans from Dallas. Everything is fair game, and let's have fun. And we did. And when the cast messed around, the cameras kept on rolling. Patrick and Larry are a couple of the biggest clowns you ever want to meet in your life, and they just feed off of each other. <laughs> I am absolutely boring up against those two <laughs> they were like little children you know they just couldn't help themselves especially at dining room scenes dinner's ready should we go in we would cringe every time we'd open the script and there would be this ewing family dinner we'd think oh no we have to sit through one of these so patrick and larry would always have food fights they would put a dinner roll on a fork and then they'd hit it and it would fly across roll jr yeah Patrick and Larry were just kids. <laughs> and at first it was just the two of them. But pretty soon Linda Gray and I just gave up and joined in. It, it was easier. There were actually some, uh, there was 
actually some off camera shenanigans and that's what what i uh how we label them for the director's cut uh off camera shenanigans that now uh, we, we chose not to show you but they were hilarious nonetheless the dialogue is going to look back at several of uh more, some of the more popular tv series back last year we were planning for this year's uh shows and we said we would look at various categories of tvs and movies and compare them one night we look at all of the of the police dramas we look at other dramas one night and then we'd ask our, our audience to help rate uh which one is is what was the best and we look at the, the, the ratings that they occurred during those times and we just said we will look at that but tonight i just wanted to look back and we're going to look at we just we're looking back at dallas tonight and we're actually going to look back at another favorite tv that i know is going to be really fun for this show uh, we're going to do this in the upcoming month or two and that's the uh the, the sitcom my end yeah i remember that don't you both broke on the scenes in the mid 80s we're going to look back at that and have a little fun with martin but uh the night is all about it's all about dallas dallas was the uh was the tv production that actually introduced the concept of sitcoms uh, i'm sorry introduced the, the concept of cliffhangers um it it had uh, cliffhangers that would go from from one season to the, the last episode of it would would leave the audience looking waiting till the to, until it started the next year to the next season of the of Dallas started to, to get an answer to the cliffhanger and then one of the most popular cliffhangers of all and we'll talk about it in a minute y'all know what it was it was uh one of the highest rated TV programs uh when they finally exposed uh when they finally did the exposure it was one of the highest rated uh tv programs in the history of uh of dallas and um so i want to just show you a little bit more about the about the behind the scenes uh shenanigans and if you ever want to just have have a good time if you're a history buff like i am and i get historical about everything go back on youtube and look at behind the scenes of or the making of uh and you won't see so many uh of those clips until the latter years latter movies latter sitcoms latter tv productions but you will always see entertainment tonight and other entities will go back and revisit and they make for some interesting tv and we're just going to be here we're just going to have a fun time with those kinds of things on the dialogue there's another uh hilarious scene uh, they showed you some of the behind the scenes. Like I said, I didn't show you everything. Some were just plain gross. Some of them, the language, I would, would not show them. And then there, there's this, uh, uh, but I want to show you this one. The language is a little risky in this one. Uh, let's go to C and look at this, uh, look at this, the shenanigans that happen off camera be between these two clowns, well-known clowns, Patrick Duffy and Larry Hagman. Hospital bed. When we were first married, I just loved her so much. Larry does this incredibly emotional farewell and, oh, she can't die, Bobby. She just can't, a little tear. Oh, Bobby, she's got to live. Patrick says, uh, would it help if we sang that old song we used to when we were kids, JR? Yeah. I was lying there thinking, this is not in my script. Do your balls hang low? Do they swing to and fro? Do they hitch like a bitch when you drag them in the ditch? Can you throw them over your shoulder like a continental soldier? Do your balls hang low? I was trying everything I could to not laugh. And at a particular moment, I couldn't help it, and I started laughing. I could have killed them both. The crew was hysterical, and um, that was one of those, you know, Dallas moments. That was one of the pretty, one of the funniest uh, behind the scenes. Uh, it was a little off color uh, song that, that 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 Larry and Patrick uh, Patrick Duffy uh, sing amongst themselves, and and, and they did that to throw uh, Linda Linda Gray uh, off script. And you see that a lot of times in 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 uh, in, 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 in motion picture or uh, TV productions. Uh, the cast will just do some things to add a little light to uh, particularly heavy scenes. I was looking at uh, last night, I was looking at one of those retro shows and uh, Kadeem Hardison and uh, Kadeem Hardison and uh, who played Whitney Gill, but I can't think of her name now. But the two of them were talking about the iconic scene in uh, a different world. 
when Whitney was was about to marry the guy who went on to fame is Papa Pope. I can't think of his name now. She was about to marry him, and and uh, uh, Dwayne Wayne uh, Padine's character came running down the aisles and broke up the the, the marriage. And uh, he said that was such a heavy scene for him that he had predetermined that it had to be done in one take because it was so emotional for him to film that scene. And he said, and if you, if any of you all saw that scene in a different world, I know I'm dating myself, but I'm, I'm old as a calendar. And they were rolling, and, and, and he had given someone the instruction to pull him to grab his left arm, and that was a key to him to say to go on script and start speaking those things that were in the script. And he said, but then the emotion of it caught him, and as they were pulling him back, all he could do was says, uh, was say, is, 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 is no, Whitney, no. And that's when Whitney turned around. A uh, Whitney turned around. And uh, it came running to him and left old boy at, at the altar and married uh, Kadeem's character, uh, Dwayne Wade. <clears throat> Excuse me, Dwayne Wade. It was a, uh, it was hilarious. Uh, but he said that was just such an emotionally heavy scene. We're gonna look at some cuts in tonight's thing that were also some emotionally heavy scenes, and I can remember seeing them uh, when they occurred when they were broadcast. And if they were if they were emotionally heavy for for those characters, it especially was emotionally uh, heavy for for we fans of the show, uh, and I and I can remember where I was, what I was doing, and everything. Dallas was originally, believe this or not, it was not originally uh, written to uh, to make the, 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 it was not originally made that J.R. Ewan would be the main star of the show. Larry Hagman's character would be the star of the show. Now, can you believe that? <clears throat> Has there ever been a greater villain in the history of TV than J.R. Ewan? The show's premise was originally um, that Big Jock Ewan, uh, played by Big Jim Davis, uh, had, had stolen Miss Ellie from uh, Digger Barnes, who was uh, Cliff Barnes' dad in J.R. Ewan's uh, protagonist, antagonist, Throughout the whole sh the whole series, and uh, that's that kind of kicked off what was and he and an oil company they had wildcatted together. Allegedly, Jock Ewan stole uh, Digger Bonds's half of, of of the company, and then if that was not enough, then he stole his 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 girl. He stole Miss Ellie and married her, and this caused a downward spiral for for uh, Digger Bonds, uh, Cliff Bonds's dad. And uh, Willard Digger Barnes played in several of the earlier episodes. He died off, I think, in, in, in year season at the end of season two or somewhere around there. But um, so that started the the Barnes Ewan feud that we all saw play out for those uh, fourteen seasons. But originally, the 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 plot of the show was supposed to be uh, Bobby Ewan. Who had returned from school? Who who was uh, the wildcatter, the guy who who went on the road and did things for for UN Oil, which was the the basis of the show. And Bobby Ewan married uh, Digger Barnes's uh, Cliff Cliff Barnes's sister, and uh, which which set off uh, set off problems for both sides for the Ewans who could not stand the Barnes. And for the remaining Barnes, Cliff Barnes, who of course couldn't stand the idea of his sister marrying a Ewan. And that just enhanced the, the, the rivalry, the bitterness, the anger, everything that took place in the show, that that was what uh, that was what what was supposed to be the basis of the show. That was the original premise of the show. The show started out on Sunday nights, and it started out as a a, a five, it started out as a miniseries. And CBS enjoyed the success of the show so much that they turned it into, so the miniseries in effect was the first year, and then next year it came back as a, as a full series. Now, the, 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 that cliffhanger that we're gonna spend some time talking about tonight, <clears throat> CBS came to, um, came to, 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 to the producers of Lorimer, Leonard Katzman, and said, we want, uh, is, is, is they were, and, and like 
is when show when like the eighth episode was being played out, he said, "Let's I uh, we we need two more episodes." And at this point, well, we'll talk about the cliffhanger in a minute. But the premise of the show was not supposed to be Jr. Larry Hagman played that role so well that it became he became the star of the show. He became the star of the show, and everything evolved around the character Jr. Ewan. So Larry Hagman was seen on tape saying Larry Hagman was actually raised in the state of Texas, so it was easy for him to go back and and pick up that Texas draw. He had the uh, he had the, the 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 dress, the hat, and he even had a natural. He had a real limp in real life, and and that played into the GR character so well. He said he actually uh, built that character off of a guy that he saw growing up on the outskirts of Dallas in real life. He said the guy was rich, but he was mean. He was conniving. Everything that Jr. that we saw broadcast uh, and seen as Jr. Is what is what we saw come out by this character. So Jr. Uh, 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 Dallas was 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 a, was a portrayal. Just remember this: the series debuted in the '80s. It was when wealth and riches it was the Reagan uh, era. Wealth and riches and being, you know, capitalism in full effect. So it was a full portrayal of wealth, of of, of sex, of intrigue, conflict, and of course. Uh, power struggles, power struggles, and everything centered around the Barnes-Ewing feud, the Barnes-Ewing feud. In fact, one of the greater cliffhangers uh, the, around the end of the show and around 1990 uh, had to do with the Barnes-Ewing feud, feud. And as you know, Oak Cliff Barnes, he always usually got the downside of the, of the feud most of the times. Uh, he was on he was on on the on the losing end. So uh, I wanted to talk about that cliffhanger. I was wanting to get a little further down uh, in the show. Let me talk about some of the characters. Larry Hagman had had a very successful stint in I Dream of a Genie. In fact, about it, when I first saw him playing that role, I said, that's major. That's major major Nelson. How can he play this role? He made a dramatic shift. I mean, it really went to that guy's talents. Larry Hagman had to be one of the most talented actors throughout the history of Hollywood. Um, he, he, he played, he studied that role, he played it, he would grab the script and make it his own. Uh, some people said it was just such an improvision that he did that made the show what it was. And uh, he came off of I Dream of Jeannie, uh, Patrick Duffy, had come off of uh, the series, uh, oh, I just can't recall the name of it. I had it in my head when I started to see it. He was uh, he was Aquaman or something like that. He was similar to Aquaman. Hey, Mac, how's it going, man? And that's where he got started. And uh, uh, he was a, he, he was he, he was underwater the whole show. And he came he came on and he accepted the role of uh, of Bobby, and and that's very pivotal. And then. Uh, Jim Davis and Barbara Bell Geddes were, 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 were B actors who had uh, were career Hollywood actors. And uh, of course, uh, um, she played the role of Pamela. Uh, why can't I think of her name? Why do I have to refer to the script? Look at her name. It's, 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 it's amazing. But um, she, would, she would be on and off of the show. Um, uh, uh, oh my goodness, I can't think of her name. Uh, you know who played Pam. Um, she, she was the one who Bobby brought home and married. Well, she was the one who uh, she had been a uh, she had been in several several series, but nothing, nobody had ever uh, were, were as well known maybe as as Larry Hagman because of the success of the series I Dream of Jeannie, and he he had played. That role. I, I don't know why I couldn't think of Victoria Principal. Victoria would leave the series several times and leave it for good later on. Yeah, Victoria, thanks, Matt. So Matt was, was so let me just give you my my affiliation to the series. Uh <clears throat> some of you all know I was a I was a policeman in a, in a, in a Florida city. Uh, and uh Dallas would come on at 10 o'clock. And this was the just about the VCR stage 
And when I was, when I worked, when I worked the overnight shift, um, you either had to be to work at a quarter to 12 or you had to be to work at a quarter to 11. I would always request to be what they call late call Friday night so I could see Dallas. And when the VCR boom took off, I would always tape it. And, and I kept most of them. I think I still got all those old, old uh, Dallas somewhere. Of course, it's in syndication. You can see it. Now we just, you know, we just get it right out of out, off of our cable system. But I would always tape Dallas. But when I would request late calls on Friday night so I could see Dallas. And of course, preceding Dallas was Miami Vice. We're going to feature it one, at one point. Miami Vice made the deadly decision to go head to head with Dallas, and it was De Miami Vice's demise. We never understood why the producers and the, the producer, Michael Mann of Michael Vi uh, Miami Vice, is right down here you know, in Fort Lauderdale. Sometimes you'll ride the boat in downtown Fort Lauderdale, and you'll see him on, the, on his back porch. Sometimes, right, you just see him out there looking out over the waterways. But that was a death blow to my beloved Miami Vice when they went head to head with Dallas. Um, Something about the setting of Dallas, and I spoke to a gentleman today who actually went to uh, South Fork Ranch, South Fork Ranch, which was located right out of Dallas, a city called Parker, Texas. And uh, South Fork was the exterior where you saw a lot of the scenes, the pool scenes. I can't tell you how many characters were dipped in that pool, pushed in the pool. Uh, uh, J.R. was one of the ones himself. Uh, <clears throat> But if you've ever seen it behind the scenes, once they opened the doors of the South Pole, it was it was miniature. It was nothing like what it looked like. You saw the you saw the the uh, the, the the clip that we showed where they did the, the 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 dinner scenes in that dining room where a lot of the shenanigans went on. The script. The script would always say, um, the script would always say that, um, the script would always say that, that, um, I, I got lost. I heard that scream. Anyway, um, it would say that whenever there was a dinner scene, the ladies, Victoria Principal and, and, um, Linda Gray would, would scream. They would scream because they knew that it meant that it, it knew they knew that it meant that that those uh that there would be a food fight scene between those two funny men, Larry Hagman and uh and Patrick Duffy. And we showed you some of that, but the actual but actually, it was never anywhere near that size, nowhere near that size, the dining room inside of South Fork. So all of the inside, the interiors of South Fork were, were shown, all of the interiors were, um, all of the interior scenes were actually shown, um, all of the interior scenes. Huh? Wait, yeah, wait, uh -huh. One of uh, all of the interior scenes were actually shown inside of of uh, was shot on a soundstage in California. So what the cast would do, they would go to they would go to to uh, to California. They would go to Dallas in the summer, and for about eight to twelve weeks, they would shoot exteriors. So that you know that that was a lot of logistics and a lot of planning that they had to do. They would go there and and um, and shoot those scenes. Um, for the whole season, for the whole year, and then they would go back out to the sound stage and do the interiors where most of Dallas was done. They said at the latter years, and I, this was a fact that I didn't know. I did this in the research. I didn't know that Dallas had uh, had lost had lost uh, that, that Dallas had, had actually um, made a lot of changes because of the um, had, had Dallas made a lot of a lot of changes. Bear with me, I just had a little situation. Dallas made a lot of changes because of budget cuts and some, some characters actually, uh, and some of the main characters near the end of the series actually left, uh, were, were, were left off the, were left from, the, from Dallas because uh, uh, budget cuts. 
And one of the budget cuts consisted of them doing everything in Culver City, California, where Lorimar uh, built the built the whole sound, built the whole replica of the outside, the exteriors of South Fork, with including the pool and the initial scene that you see that you saw in the intro. So those are some of the things. Now I'm gonna, we're going to come back in just a second, and we're going to talk about the. Uh, we're gonna look at some of the, the the major cliffhangers. There were two major cliffhangers throughout the, the tenure of the of the series. Do you have any questions? Uh, go ahead. Let's see. Uh, uh, he was an interpreter in the movie Fall Safe. Yeah, Victoria. So yes. So uh, Meg, you got questions? Anybody? Uh, uh, put your questions on board and let's let's throw them out. Let's deal with them. This is going to be the first of a look back at a television series that we have. Uh, that we look that we've been looking at, uh, and we're going to look at, like I say, the next one will probably be the sitcom Martin. I, that was just in me. I saw that the other night. What we're going to do now? We're going to run to to our break, and uh, we're going to come back in the second half and, and and look at some further clips and have some more fun looking back at the motion at the television series Dallas. <laughs> Bookmaker Creations, they're the ones who make this show, produce this show, and, and, and uh, New Life Church Without Walls, they do our, our uh, product, produce all of our uh, services and Bible study and everything we do. Listen, they'll make you look good. Any of your virtual productions, web building, you got to go get them, web building and everything. That's gogigacreations.com. Don't waste time. Just hit them up right now. They'll take care of you. The toys of Marquia, they'll take great care of you. Contact them right now. They'll get you and, and get, a, get, a, get a quote. Contact them right now for all of your virtual needs. The pandemic is over, but virtuality is here to stay. Amen? Okay. I think I'm in church, right? So Zoom and, and, and all of those things, they do all of that for you. That's smorgogigacreations.com. They got you. Listen. Uh, this will be the last night that we'll observe Women's History Month, and we want to do that now uh, with a very special young lady. Politician and attorney who made history as the first woman, first black woman, and first person of South Asian descent to serve as a vice president of the United States. Prior to her vice presidency, she served as a United States Senator from California and as the Attorney General of California. Throughout her career, Harris has been a vocal advocate for progressive causes such as criminal justice reform, health care access, and women's rights. As a vice president, she continues to play a significant role in the Biden administration, focusing on issues such as voting rights and academic recovery. Ms. Kamala Harris, we salute you tonight. Uh, we could not do a Women's History Month and not salute you uh, as the first woman and the first uh, African Asian uh, to hold the office of Vice President in the United States. And tonight we we uh, we, we we salute we salute you, and we're so glad that. Uh, we're so glad to salute you during this series. I want to give a shout out to, to our granddaughter, uh, Joy, that's, that's the producer's uh, daughter. She did a, a series of uh, Black History voiceovers for her for us several years ago. And as we were preparing to do these uh, women's history observance, I was preparing scripts, but I said, we got the best voice on radio. And thank you, Joy, just for, for taking that over for us and doing it. Listen, we want to talk about uh, cliffhangers because cliffhangers was actually got they got their start in TV on on Dallas, and uh, cliffhangers is is what what made uh, uh, Dallas. It, it, it was to the point that that 
every year uh, at the end of the season, there was a cliffhanger. And of course, the greatest cliffhanger we know was the end of season three. And here's what happened. The producers went back, as I said earlier, they went back to, to, uh, to the producers of Dallas because of its ratings boost. And they said, listen, let's go back and let's bring in uh, some more. Uh, let's bring, let's, they ordered two more episodes of Dallas for season two. And it's, it's at season three. It is just so funny that you would hear the, the uh, you would hear the cast talking about, well, what do we do? What do we do? We got to do this. And they, and they said, let's introduce the concept of a real cliffhanger. They had had some measure of cliffhangers, but nothing like season three's cliffhanger. And what they decided to do, I won't use the language, but they just says, shoot this, you know, the SO, whatever. Shoot him, shoot that, shoot JR. And so that's what they did. They decided to shoot JR Ewan. And uh, that was the that was the cliffhanger, and that's the cliffhanger of all cliffhangers. And and not only was it was it an awesome cliffhanger, but it also uh, it brought about um, it brought about it introduced cliffhangers in 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 TVs in TV TV series after that started doing a lot of uh, a lot of cliffhangers. So I think that would be uh, uh, D 2019. Uh, let's 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 just go back and look at that whole little episode. Holy smokes, that might work. You hear the gunshot, you see him take the hit, he goes to the floor, freeze frame, end of the season. From that moment on, this show was the leading show in television for the next six years. And it was it was just just like that. For the first time ever, a London betting establishment made book on a fictional So I thought we had a little bit more of that, but that was that was uh that was the, the, the cliffhanger of cliffhangers. That was Who Shot GR. The actual name of that episode uh was 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 uh it was not uh it was not called uh Who Who Shot GR. It was called uh uh it was called the shot. And so um they played it up and, and a lot of a lot of things occurred in the midst of that that, that made it even uh even funnier um so they they do this who shoots who shot jr episode and during the summer of of uh, uh during that summer everybody wanted to know who shot jr i mean it went beyond people who never watched the show one time Young people were wearing T-shirts that said, who shot JR? Uh, London, that was a clip that it was trying to play out in England. There was a, there, they took out betting odds as to who actually shot JR. And what the producers did, they keep it such a secret that not even Larry Hagman knew who shot him, was that everybody who had a beef with JR Ewan filmed shooting him, and they decided to make it humorous. You can go to some of the docs and see that. They like take this and take this and take this. Just kept shooting him. His dad shot him. His wife shot him. His 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 brother shot him. Uh, Ray Krebs is his other brother shot him. Everybody took a shot at shooting Jr. So that at the end, nobody actually knew who shot Jr. One of the things that Dallas did with it, it really introduced the concept of secrecy on the set of a motion picture or a TV production. And you're gonna see real secrecy in just a second. But they kept that, and if as it would play out, and the, and it was leading to the season, and and it was it was set to be just, I mean, a blockbuster of viewership. I mean, like something we had never seen before, with with uh, so many millions of people across the globe wanting to see it. Larry Hagman revealed that he was paid. I mean, he wasn't paid. He was offered. $250,000, now that's kind of small right now to reveal a big secret, but he was offered $250 million, uh, $250,000 to reveal who shot him. He was actually invited to, he was actually invited to the White House. He was actually invited to the White House and while invited to the White House, uh, he was, he was uh, President Reagan asked him uh, a president Ford, I understand, who was not in office, reached out to say, hey, 
Tell me, man, who shot who shot you? It was so funny. The betting odds, it was just, it caused a frenzy. And to make it even worse, to make it even worse, to make things worse, the show uh there was a there was a um there was a strike. There was a writer's strike that year. The last one until the one we just experienced this last year. This last year. That's why a lot of our TV programs have not come on. All American has not come on yet. Um, uh, All American has not come on. Uh, uh, the Equalizer has just started coming on. That's why we're behind on all of our programs. Was the writer's strike. Well, there was a writer's strike, and and the writer's strike, the writer's strike caused uh, caused the show to be. Produce. So what did that do? That just blew up the entry because everybody wanted to know who shot JR. If that wasn't enough suspense and entry, the next thing that occurred was that J.R. Ewan, the, uh, well, uh, Larry Hagman, who played J.R. Ewan, made a decision that if I'm ever going to get my money, because he knew he actually was the star who drove the show, if I'm ever going to get paid, now is the time to hold out my contract. So you had all kinds of things happening. When the strike was over and the show was ready to go back, back into production, there was no GR unit. And so the first day that they finally settled, he he would go on and say, and you really need to go back and look at some of these, uh, the backdrops of these, look at these uh, YouTube, all of these, uh, these things. He said, that he didn't get quite every penny he got, he said, but it was only lacking a few pennies. So he he basically held the production of, of Dallas. Uh, he, he held them at bay because this was a time they even thought about bringing in another person to play the character. They talked about cutting the character off, and they knew that he was the cash cow. Larry Hayden was the cash cow that made Dallas the production that it was. So that's what we were. That's where we are. You just saw one of the greatest cliffhangers in the history of TV. And if that wasn't enough, if the strike wasn't enough, if JR, and by the way, when Larry Hagman returned to, 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 to the scene, uh, uh, people were wondering, is he going to show up? Is he here? What are we going to do? He came in a helicopter that made a grand entrance. It had champagne for everything. One of the things Patrick definitely revealed every day while they were, uh, while they were uh, particularly on, uh, while they were away shooting on location, they would meet every morning at seven o'clock and start their days. The two of them would start their day off with a glass of champagne. And uh, Larry would carry champagne throughout the day. And he said, amazingly, it never affected his work. And we kind of know Larry Hagman's uh, history. He ended up having a liver transplant about 10 years before he actually passed. Um, so that, that was just a, a funny thing that if, 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 the, if the show didn't, if the script didn't have enough entry, it was further intrigued by the fact that uh, he that, that that there was a writer's script that pushed the season back, and then when, when the season got ready, he was on strike himself, holding out for a contract extension. He says, if there ever was going to be a time to do it, this is the time. So there were several other uh, cliffhangers that that happened on on Dallas. Uh, one of some of the more noticeable ones was Jr. putting Sue Ellen in the sanitarium. That kind of got old. Uh, one of the other one was was uh, uh, Cliff Barnes actually takes uh, possession of you and all. That was near the end of the show. In fact, the show had a unique ending. I didn't like it. Uh, I, I was all geared up to watch it, and I, I didn't care for it. I didn't even watch it after I saw how ridiculous it was starting out. But one of the other uh, one of the other uh, funny cliffhangers, not funny, but one of the other notable cliffhangers of the show was a clip that we're about to show and I and I'm really uh I think I, I, I got more uh more 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 show than we got cliffhangers uh than we got tape but the next one was uh the, the cliffhanger of uh in this one and, and I'm just gonna share with you about it. So let's 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 go to the next let's 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 go to the next uh cliffhanger. This occurred and this was very controversial controversial the JR cliffhanger was at the end of season three. This was at the end of season nine when Patrick Duffy uh, decided to leave the show. Let's see. Uh, I think it'll be uh, E. That there was one departure that would shake South Fork to its core. Patrick Duffy wanted Bobby to make a grand exit. They even sent a car for him. 
Bobby? I didn't want to ride off into the sunset and then have everybody pretend that I might be coming back any minute. So I said, we really should kill him. Just kill him dead. And they thought, oh, and they finally agreed. So I died. When Patrick left the show, what a sad thing. We all love Patrick. You know, here we have this fellow dying. I cried real tears. I, I had no trouble at all imagining that it was going to be no more Patrick. Don't do this to me, Bobby. Don't leave me. I begged him Bobby, not to leave. I begged Sue Ellen not to leave, too. But, you know, they felt it was a time to go on and do other things. Well, Patrick found out it was time to come back, too. <laughs> so... That was, a, that was a sad night for me. I remember uh, I, I was at a point where I would walk to work if I walked overnight shift because it was too hot to walk during the day. I walked in that night, and I remember after seeing that, that scene that you just saw, just how absolutely sad that was. So you heard uh, Ray Canelli, who played Ray Krebs, say that, uh, that he, it, he had no problems crying real tears in that scene because he did not want to leave the show. He did not want to see that good buddy, Bobby. Remember, uh, Patrick Duffy and, and, and uh, Larry Hagman were not just stars of the show, but they were, were were clowns. They kept the cast motivated and moving, and they were just so hilarious. So because of that, uh, because of that, it made it difficult to see him leave. And man, did he ever play that part? Did he ever play that last part? And so. I saw that that night as I was leaving for work, and it was really, really, really sad. And what, one of the things that made it sad was I could remember like it was yesterday. I could hear uh, Larry Hagman saying, oh, don't do this to me, Barbara. Don't leave me. And, and then a, a fake tear, uh, I, I understand he put an onion in his eye, and a tear fell from his eye. Never never had we seen J.R. cry uh, uh, during the course of the series. And that was just, oh, it was crazy. It was crazy. Now. A lot of stuff happened during that during that that year. It was a cliffhanger, and we didn't know if if uh, Bobby was if you heard the monitor ticking him signal seven or dead. We didn't know if, if when when it came back on the next season if he was going to miraculously be brought back to life, if his tenure on the show was actually really over or what. Uh, but 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 as it was, Patrick Duffy wanted to leave the show. He thought he could do some things on his own because he had made his star power big enough. Well, it just so happens it didn't quite work out that way. You heard Larry Hagman kind of talking about that at the end. Uh, it didn't quite work out that way. Uh, he did some commercials. He did a, 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 a couple of uh, feature movies, but nothing ever took off. He recorded an album. He wasn't a great singer. And none of that actually took off. And so Dallas went on and Pam married... Uh, a guy who had been looking at her even while she was married to Bobby, uh, Mark Grayson, took on. And so they went on with the next season, and these things occurred. And then all of a sudden, this happened. Next clip. He said, you can't come back unless that whole year was a dream. We laughed, went, ha, ha, ha. And I went out to talk to Larry and he said, come on back. We're going to have fun. And I thought, yeah, I'm not having fun out here. And then I came back. TV programs discussed it. Newspapers reported it. How exactly would Bobby Ewing be brought back from the dead? No cast member knew what was going to happen, including Victoria. Millions tuned in on Friday night to witness Bobby's apparent resurrection. Nobody knew how I was coming back on the show. Everyone thought Bobby would appear during a wedding scene. Come on, Bobby! But that was not to be. I couldn't film anywhere on a lot in Los Angeles because somebody would know what we were doing. So Leonard hired a commercial crew, a crew of guys who only do television commercials. And he bought a case of Irish spring soap and we built a shower. I was called in to come do the scene unexpectedly. And I had this from wardrobe, but I had never worn it. So I had taken it home to keep it. I think that's called theft, but nevertheless, they called me and they said, do you have something of your own you could bring? So I thought, oh, I might as well bring in the one I took. And I brought it in, went to the shower, opened the door, and no one was there. 
I thought I was supposed to be having a nervous breakdown. <laughs> so one of the happiest days of my life was when they cut it together and Patrick was in the shower. actually turned and said, good morning. And you can have a good morning too if you wake up like the Duffies and shower with Irish Spring. And when we watched the show in my house that night, I probably counted to 30 and the phone rang and it was Victoria. I have no idea what I said. I'm just sure that, that, that I, I was incredibly happy and I'm probably cursed. She's going, I can't believe I can't. She had no idea it was going to be that. So it, it was very exciting. It was really so Lena Cashman did a fantastic job of introducing or, or really maintaining secrecy on set. And I guess he learned it from season three with the JR, with, with the Who Shot JR cliffhanger. And in that cliffhanger, uh, nobody knew who shot him, not even only 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 Leonard, only only uh the, the producer and the person who who uh shot uh who actually spliced the tape for that show that night. Well, for this one, you just heard Patrick Duffy tell just what extraordinary lengths they went to to keep this secret. Now, this is real controversial, and I'm going to talk about it in a second. They do this, this dream episode, and they, they rent a, they, on a sound stage. They built that shower that you saw. They actually built that shower. He has this whole case of, of uh, Irish Spring soap. And if you remember the scene, you see actually the green soap that he was lathering up with. And what he did was um, to make sure, he said they, they, they shot it on the first tape. He turned around the first tape and said, uh, good morning. The, pet, the Duffy family, uh, but he said he did it on the first tape, but just to keep it secret, the only person who went there was a cameraman, Leonard Katzman, the producer, and 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 one of the uh one of the one of the writers the only ones on set and that and that person was his son so it, he knew he would keep a secret and and, and patrick duffy of course we, we welcome your comments by the way please uh please write in before we go off and let's 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 chop this up a little bit but those were the only ones who knew and he said he shot it on the first tape and they and they were through but leonard katzman stayed there for eight hours continuously doing that over and over. So it actually looked like an Irish Spring commercial. So nobody knew. You saw Victoria Principal say she didn't even know. What happened was she shot that scene and uh, she thought she was just uh, shooting a regular scene and they spliced it together. You saw the reaction of that live, uh, live uh, audience over in England when they saw it. Well, I don't, I don't care how many times I see that reaction. It always brings uh, laughter and joy to me because Everybody was happy to see Bobby come back. Were they really? Not everybody was. In fact, many people say that was the downfall of the show. The rating started to plunge. They said that the dream episode was just too much uh, to believe. Um, they, they said, for one thing, um, and I'm going to ask you a question, Toya. They said, for one thing, um, too much had gone into that season. They had brought new cast in and had this, the, the, the writing had kind of gone in a different direction. And uh, actually, uh, Susan Howard, who played Ray Krebs' wife, Donna Krebs, uh, had, had become the writer. And, and one of the things I failed to tell you that that uh, the cast, Leonard Katzman actually died uh, halfway through Dallas's run. And the cast were uh, Larry Hagman, Patrick Duffy, Linda Gray, Victoria, many of them uh, uh, directed many of the scenes. In fact, Larry Hagman had worked himself up as an executive producer. And so what ended up happening was uh, Susan Howard, who played uh, Ray Krabs' wife, never came back because she said it was just too much to believe. And the show's uh, ratings did plummet after that. And they also made some other what J.R. you and what Larry had to say when states they played up the European thing. Uh, he put down the Cadillac and started driving Mercedes Benz, and they had a plot line that shot a lot of time over in Moderia. Uh, and he said those were just fatal things to the scene. I just think it just kind of played it, itself out. But uh, you saw what extraordinary lengths they did. This stuff I knew that they kept it secret, but I didn't know the lengths that they had gone 
to do that. You ask, uh, what was your favorite thing about the show? Uh, I guess the even though even though you guys make me look good every every Monday night, uh, I never was a radio a TV guy. I never wanted to be in front of a camera because I never thought I was uh, you know that kind of camera worthy. I was into voiceovers and radios and stuff like that. But I always admired great acting and writing and, and things like that. And I think it was just the mastery of Larry Hagman of the GR character that would probably be my favorite thing about the show. Um, he was just uh, he was just amazing. I heard Howard Keel, who came on later to replace uh, when, when Big Jim Davis died, he became Miss Ellie's husband. And uh, off off camera, he I know he said one time, probably four years before the end of the show, he said that this show could go on with, without anybody, without everybody. We can live without everybody on this ensemble. But if Larry Hagman ever left the show, it would be the show's demise. And that's really saying something about a character. And uh, he really played that role and he played it just exceptionally well. He he owned it. And remember, this is a guy whom we had last seen. We saw him on a few B movies, but whom we really last saw as, uh, he was the guy that we really last saw as a, a comedy playing, starring in a comedy with that dream of Jeannie. Let me get to that part about Jeannie. So, the show will ultimately end with uh, UNO getting in trouble with the government and having to sell UNO, which was GR UN. He cared about that more than he cared about anybody or anything. He was really married to, to UNO. And guess who came back to be the one? She stayed in the cut until the final papers were to be signed to buy, the, to buy UNO. It was Barbara Eaton who was his castmate on I Dream of Jeannie. And I always liked her, always liked her. I hated her after that. I hated her after that. It is amazing. It just goes to show you how you can't, uh, you can't carry characters over into the, to real life. And a lot of characters, a, a lot of stars talk about that. They say that that's what they get all the time. People carry this, this, their, their roles over and expect that of them in real life and in and, and, and Dallas. And that was almost new back then. They talked about how they could go nowhere, nowhere, because that show was so popular. And we hear that now. Uh, so there was a Dallas reboot. Troy, thank you. There actually was a Dallas reboot in 2012, which was uh about 20 years after the original show, let me tell you how it ended. So it ends with, with her buying the company. That was the week before the last week. Then the final week ends with the fantasy episode that I couldn't stand with uh, nobody's hardly living at South Fourth anymore. Miss Ellie's gone. They're all gone. They, they moved to Asia. The kids have gone. Uh, the, the, the wives are not there. Bobby goes up to JR's room. He hears a gun cock. And then it goes into a two hour episode of a fantasy episode where Bobby's a playboy, JR is a wimp. It was just, it was, it was hard. It was too hard to look at. I couldn't even look at it. And then the show comes back to reality at the end and you hear a gunshot. And, and, and then Patrick Duffy kicks the door open and he hollers out, no. And Dallas ends like that. That that's how it ended. So it ended like that, but they did do two uh two Dallas two hour movies uh during that 20 year interval between the ending of the series and the reboot that TNT picked up in 2012. So and one of those movies, it was really bad. Uh JR's appearance was really bad because that that, that liver ailment had he he had shrunk. I mean he lost his his size. Not only his weight, but he like he shrunk as a, as he went down, and uh, it, it, none of them carried the weight of of one of the worst Dallas weekly episodes. But they did a reboot, so let's go to that picture. Let's see that cast of the reboot, and maybe I should have had their names up. But the cast it, it's the last graphic. Uh, yeah, we can't hardly see them, but o, OJR and them were in the reboot uh, episode. 
He had older sons. John Ross had grown to be uh, quite a man, but he was just like his dad. He did the same kind of conniving stuff that his dad did. And uh, it was challenging. And I had I really gotten into it. Uh, it ran three years. And then Larry Hackman died in real life. And I'll never forget that cold winter night that they did his funeral scene. Uh, they brought Sue Ellen back. And she, well, actually, she played in a, uh, Linda Gray played in the reboot. And the, 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 pe the people who returned were uh, uh, Linda Gray, JR, and, and, and Larry, and, uh, and Patrick Duffy. And uh, they came back. And you see how I just call him JR's man, got a name is Larry Hagman. And they came back and then they had a, a cast around them. Um, and, and it really, TNT did a great job with it. But after, uh, after Larry Hagman died in real life, they decided, I think, to, to end the series. They thought that that, and I don't think it was really killing in the ratings because it was just a few of us hangers on, hanger owns who, who just loved all things Dallas. And, uh, and so we watched. Now, listen, here's what's funny. Dallas was the best of the soap operas, and there were some good uh, dr uh, late night soap operas, but Dallas was the absolute best. Let's see. Do you think that Dallas should be, yeah, we did the reboot, uh, who would be the cast? So that was, I just, I think I just answered that. They had three of the original stars. Patrick Duffy is now 77 years old. One of the things that happened during the course of, of uh, Dallas was Patrick's, Patrick Duffy is from Montana. And his mother and father own a bar out there, and they were brutally shot, and killed in a robbery out there. And he talked about it, and the cast talked about it when he returned to the set. How do we do this? And he just said everything just works so naturally, and the cast was so loving and surrounding him with such love, and everything worked well. But those are the realities that that happened uh, during during a during a long series. That that series ran fourteen years. I hope you have enjoyed. It was so much fun researching this this uh, for this show tonight, looking back at all the old tape, all old episodes, and looking at all of the uh, a look back at YouTube. We had a whole lot of great resources. Uh, Entertainment Tonight did a lot of uh, the, the cast 25 years later. And uh, it's, just, it's just really interesting to look back and look at those shows. Dallas was was really a killer. And we so much enjoyed it when it was live uh, in its first run. We enjoyed the reboot and we enjoyed looking back uh, at it. Now, it was a first of its kind. And uh, I don't think we ever see another. The next show that we're going to look at, this will probably be five or six weeks from now. We're going to look back at the uh, sitcom. Martin, we're going to go back and have a little fun looking at Martin. And uh, and uh, maybe that's a little, with, with maybe some of our younger audience, audience can better relate to because that was in the mid eighties and uh, we just, uh, we'll come back. So tonight, uh, I know I promised on next week, we were gonna do a show that talked about it. We we're gonna bring some of our guests back on from last week's show. We got great ratings on this show. Thank you for, for being a part of that. When we ask the question, uh, are the racist policies and rhetoric a real return, a desire to return to America's shameful past, or is it to appeal to a political base? And uh, we had a we had a very uh, we had a very lively audience, a very lively panel on that. And so next week we were originally going to look at uh, President Forty Five, with all of the indictments, all of the impeachments, everything that's going against him. We're gonna we we're gonna ask the question. How does half of the American electorate still want him after that? Um, but next week, when I look at the calendar, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's what we call Resurrection Monday, or we used to call it Easter Monday. And I'm not going to deal with anything like that on that, that night. But we're going to look back at, we're going to pull some clips from a previous show that we had done with uh, our sister Erica Rawls, who, when I say just barely got out of the city gates of Israel. When the war started, she beat it by mere seconds, the gates closing and the bus getting out and then her getting to safety and then getting to a, uh, to divide where she could be transported back to America. She and I spoke last week and we're gonna do some clips from that show and we're gonna update the situation 
that's going on over in Gaza. And I, I may bring uh, Donato back on to talk about that and, and have someone talk about the other half. Let's let's talk about something um, that, that we need to improve as a country and, and improve our stance and be objective in how we deal with all, all people, all of we're all God's people. And uh, we can't side with one when they're being brutal to another, just like we can't go stand by and see one company, one country attack. So that's what that's how uh, we're gonna finish out the month of March. It's next Monday night's dialogue. We're gonna look back at pieces of that show. Uh, join us, and then the following week, we are gonna ask, how can you support this guy after this? Dialogue with Dozy, it's been a pleasure. See you next week, 8 p.m. Oh, after all these years, it's hard to keep it up. It defined the 80s as much as Reagan, Thatcher, and Filofaxes. 300 million people would get in a lather every week over the world's first super soap, Dallas. I'm still a hero down there. They love me. I love them.